Vale, començo, començo jo dient unes brevíssimes paraules. Eh, mm, Willkommen in Barcelona und in Institut d'Estudis Catalans. Eh, wir danken Ihnen die Einladung zur 100 Jahren Feier der Boratoms angenommen zu haben und an den Aktivitäten unserer Gesellschaft zu diesen Anlass teilzunehmen. Eh, mit freundlichen Grüßen, vielen Dank. Ich habe es in Catalan, weil die Schuleta ja ha acabat. Eh, sí? <laughs> bueno, eh, com sabeu, bueno, alguns ho sabeu, altres no, eh, soc la nova acabada d'estrenar presidenta de la Societat Catalana d'Història i la Ciència de la Tècnica. Llavors aprofito el broadcast aquest que ens estan veient aquí <laughs> des de tot arreu per, dir, per un minut de publicitat. Eh, bueno, la Societat Catalana d'Història i la Ciència de la Tècnica és una societat petita però molt activa i molt energètica i amb molta gent darrere que fa molta feina i llavors volia eh, agrair eh, en primer lloc a les seccions de ciències de l'Institut i a la Secretaria Científica per el suport institucional que ens permet eh, fer aquestes activitats, després al CEIC i a, en particular a l'Agustí Nieto per les, eh, diem, per les activitats eh, que fan col·laboració amb la societat, que són cada vegada, no només l'Agustí Nieto, tenim aquí també el Xavier Roquer que ha col·laborat molt, Carlos Tabernero, bueno, el CEIC en general per la col·laboració eh, estreta i després també agrair a, a les persones que, que treballen eh, el nostre el nostre esperit inspirador des de més enllà de l'Atlàntic, el Pep Simón, que si m'està veient i si no potser ho veurà gravat. Gràcies, Pep, per, bueno, per ser allà i, i, i treballar i, i continuar seguint les activitats de la societat i, i col·laborant. Després a la Clara Florença, que és la coordinadora de la Comissió de Col·loquis, que ara també la tenim a Cambridge, eh? però moltes gràcies, Clara, que estàs fent una feina fantàstica. I a tota la Comissió de Col·loquis, eh, amb també el, a l'Agustín López, que ara s'encarregarà de les tasques de comunicació, difusió, etc. I, com sabeu, a l'acte d'avui es, eh, es retransmet en directe i, a més, podeu, us recordo que podeu, eh, a partir del compte de Twitter de la societat, enviar preguntes en directe, també, si, si voleu. Eh? O sigui que, bé, res, només això Gràcies a tots i gràcies a tots per venir, per ser aquí, per seguir les nostres activitats. Molt bé, gràcies, Emma. Uh, since this is a sort of uh, global lecture, I will shift to English to introduce our speaker today and first thanking again the Institut d'Estudis Catalans i la Societat Catalana de Història de la Ciència i la Tècnica for this uh, uh, welcoming atmosphere here. Uh, let me just introduce uh, Dr. Arne Schirmacher, uh, our speaker today. It's a pleasure to have him here. Uh, Arne uh, has a very solid background in natural sciences and history and philosophy. He did a physics degree and later a PhD in mathematical physics uh, and, and held, uh, held postdocs in Berkeley in the Max Planck Institute uh, for History of Science in Berlin, and also has been researcher in, in the Deutsches Museum in Munich. Uh, he is now presently based at the Humboldt University in Berlin with a sort of research guest uh, professorship in, in an Institute of Historical Studies. Uh, and I think he has uh, very actively developed uh, two main lines of research. One is linked to history of physics, in, in general, in a broad sense, especially, well, he has done very detailed work, for example, editing the physical, the physics lectures of David Hilbert. Uh, he has worked also in a, in a collaborative project at the Max Planck Institute and the history of quantum physics, but he is also very much concerned about artifacts, iconography, the public image of physics in exhibitions. This is something related to the topic he will present today. This is probably one of, the, of, of, of his main research lines. The other one is science communication, science popularization, especially the history of science popularization in 20th century Europe. There is a lot of research, I think, on 19th century popularization across Europe. Scholars have been working on this field very actively in the last 10, 20 years, but I think Arne has made excellent contributions to fill this gap of how can we write the history of science communication in the 20th century. And he has already achieved important publications in the field. Yeah? For example, I think there is a book in, in, in German published in 2007 
edited together with uh, Dr. Sibylla Nikolov, uh, Wissenschaft und Öffentlichkeit als uh, Ressourcen für einander, which is, I think, a, a very important book which should probably deserve an English translation. Yeah? And it's, it's probably the beginning of, of his interest in this problem of science communication in the past and the way in which expert and lay people interact in the way in which we construct knowledge. And he also contributed uh, and led the, the publication of a special issue of the, the journal Science and Education in, in, in 2012, uh, entitled Popular Science Between News and Education, a European Perspective. And recently, he has been also the editor of a special issue of Science in Context, a uh, special issue devoted to science communication in Europe from different national approaches. And as you can see, the, the word Europe is also important there. I think Arne has a special sensitivity to the European character of science. He has been, I think, a very active member of research groups such as the European Society for the History of Science, the international research group STEP, Science and Technology in the European Periphery. He also, uh, one year ago, I think, organized a workshop funded by the European Science Foundation and Science in the Air in Europe, the way in which radio and the 20th century media influence science in in the 20th century. And I think this is important, and it's something that I, I, I want to, to put in value, is his main uh, interest in European projects in a broad sense related to science. I think in, 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 in his CV, I think there is a sentence saying something like, my broad interest is something like European cultures of knowledge and science since the 19th century. But I think summarize very well this sensitivity. And this is perhaps one of the reasons because we were engaged in, in a very fruitful collaboration so in the recent years in, with our group in Barcelona who has been working also on science popularization and communication in the last years and also with groups in Greece, in Italy, in, in, in Portugal and in other European countries. And I think this is probably one of the pluses of his approach the hope that we can really build up a truly European network of scholars working on these cultural problems on science. Today he will talk about uh, Bohr, a very famous uh, physicist, and the famous Bohr atoms. And, well, you have the title there of, of his lecture. I, I, I shall also remember that tomorrow we will have a, at our center in the Autonomy University a second talk devoted to science centers and Oppenheimer, another uh, great luminary of this 20th century scientific culture. But today we are all looking forward to listening to him talking and discussing if the famous Bohr atomic model matters or didn't matter in the past or what exactly happened. Arno, welcome, and it's your turn. Hmm? Okay, thank you very much, both of you, for this very nice introduction, and I really am happy and proud to be in this place tonight. I think it's three years ago in one of the earliest uh, conference of the European Society for the History of Science, which took place here, that I first mm -hmm got to know Barcelona and this nice premises, which then served for whole conference. And I think it was two years earlier that in 2008 I wrote two emails, one to Agusti and one to a Polish colleague, which known of them I have known before or have written before and just had... quite a lot of activity this year for 100 years of Bohr's atomic model. And um, 
many of the physical journals were looking for ways what to do for such a centenary, and often it's a little bit as if you talk to your neighbor and just whispering something in your ear and he the, or she, your neighbor, is whispering to somebody else, that these stories about history of science become more and more distracted and so you get a grand narrative of the great invention and these great people. And clearly, uh, I tried to uh, approach this um, big an an anniversary of the, say, of the planetary model of the atom from a different point of view, looking a little bit, what, what does it really mean? What is a model and what are these images? Are they new? And uh, so how much, apart from, say, calculations and um, laws and theory, does the uh, aesthetic value of images of material models um, contribute to the history and to the understanding of physics. And so just to relieve me from doing all the history in detail, I just would like to point you to two rather recent um, publications. On the right-hand side, it's of Helge Krag, who has studied Bohr and his life and his models for almost all of his life, I might say, and condensed it in this volume on Niels Bohr and the quantum atom. And he probably also the publisher, made him use this typical dates, 1913 to 1925, as if it was invented in 1913, which I try to persuade you today is not true, and as if it has ceased in physics, physical importance in 1925 and quantum mechanics was invented, which I also would like to try to persuade you that this is not correct, that it lives still today, and it still tells us a lot about physics today. And on the left-hand side, this is a, um, a rather recent um, contribution, with also, I think this is a typical title, um, the, the, the uh, publishers love, love Literature and the Quantum Atom. This is actually interesting in this respect as the private letters of Niels Bohr to his fiancée and later wife, Margarete Nörland, have been studied in detail to help reconstruct the shivering, seeking, searching, thinking of Bohr in the years of 1911 to 1913, which then ended up in what we identify as the Bohr atomic model or theory. So what I am interested in today is most of all that among the many attempts to historically grasp the quantum revolution or rather the longer term development that transformed old classical mechanics uh, and to quantum mechanics and quantum theory, often one of the following terms or a bunch of them is uh, invoked, metaphor, analogy, and model they apparently are necessary to bridge a gap, a gap that by a straightforward application of mathematical formalism or by improvements of experimental deduction cannot be overcome. For me, the most concrete ones of these of this ex, uh, as epistemological bridge objects are models or more exactly material models and real inscriptions like drawings. What is the role of such models in the history of quantum and atomic physics? Or to put it this question slightly differently, how can we embed these objects and graphical renderings but also graphical descriptions into a more long-term history of quantum and atomic physics. Here's a small gallery of what I mean, and it's only a selection. There's Perrin's atomic model of 1901, 
There's the Leonard Becker atomic model of 1904. There's Johannes Stark's atomic model for band spectra from 1908 and 1911. There's Bohr's drawing of atoms and molecules from 1912. There's Arnold Sommerfeld's, Fajan's, and others' drawings of material models of 1918 for the Deutsches Museum. There's a plates made for Bohr by people called Kramers and Holst for structure of atomic elements. There's the Pauli model of the hydrogen molecule. I, I will come to all this picture in more detail later, but I just wanted to give you this list. There's the Brachatry material models of atoms and ionic crystals thereof. There's Kirchberger's attempt to marry Bohr and Schrödinger into a model and there's Harvey White's photographs of electron clouds. The first two are without quantum theory, given in gray in my list. Those in blue use the old quantum theory, and the two in green, they try to cope with quantum mechanics. So, What's my argument for pushing models to the fore in a long-term history of quantum physics? Probably the easiest way to convince you is to use Thomas Kuhn as my staunch ally. Richard Boyd, a philosopher, and Thomas Kuhn, a historian of science, engaged in an exchange on the role of metaphors, analog analogies, etc., in science in the late 1970s, which essentially shifted the, the, the discussion from hard-to-grasp metaphors to rather concrete models. Kuhn shared Boyd's view that among the metaphors used in science, many are merely decorative and could be eliminated by adequate known metaphorical formulations, while others such are such that, and I quote, metaphorical expressions constitute, at least for a time, an irreplaceable part of the linguistic machinery of a scientific theory. Cases in which there are metaphors with which scientists use in expressing theoretical claims for which no adequate literal paraphrase is known. For the philosopher Boyd, however, Bohr's atom just was, in, was an example for such a sort of metaphor which can be eliminated as, I quote again, one can say exactly in what respect Bohr thought atoms were like solar systems without employing any metaphorical device, and this was true, Boyd claims, when Bohr's theory was proposed. For Kuhn, however, Bohr's atomic model was rather one of the what he called genuine metaphors or analogies. He proposed a more differentiated view. This is the first Bohr, uh, uh, Kuhn quote. Bohr and his contemporaries supplied a model in which electrons in the nucleus were represented by tiny bits of charged matter interacting under the laws of mechanics and electromagnetic theory. That model replaced the solar system metaphor, but not by doing so a metaphor-like process. Although one might argue to which extent Bohr's atom was taken literally, for Kuhn it had he had clear that, again a quote, even when that process of exploring potential similarities had gone as far as it could, the model remained essential to the theory. Without its aid, one cannot even today write down the Schrödinger equation for a complex atom or molecule, for it is to the model, not directly to the nature, that the various terms in that equation refer. So, models like the Bohr atom provide, according to Kuhn, an, quote, interactive, similarity-creating process, well beyond pedagogical or heuristic uses. And here's the punchline. Quote, models are not, however, merely pedagogic or heuristic. They have been too much neglected in recent philosophy of science. So, 
following Kuhn, let's put models on stage. But what exactly are models? There are two brief ways to tell this, one a la Hacking and one a la Berlin Max Planck Institute, one might say. From Kuhn's view, it's probably a small step to a hacking type of thesis. Models have a life of their own, period. This thesis cannot, however, be found with hacking. It is rather due to Margaret Morrison, who identified models to be autonomous agents. Hence, instead of looking at models of phenomena, models of data, models of theory, their representational character, their ontology, their implications for scientific realism, explanation, and the possibilities for laws and nature, etc., one can put aside all this and concentrate on the epistemological role of models. Look at the practices of science and analyze knowledge creations or change using models. Margaret Morrison puts this into two very interesting claims. First, that it is models rather than abstract theory that represent and explain the behavior of physical systems. And two, that they do so in a way that makes them autonomous agents in the production of scientific knowledge. If this is true, that in this way models, quote, occupy a separate domain of scientific investigation, a history of the development of quantum physics has to look onto models. Those of you who are a bit familiar with the approach of the Berlin Max Planck Institute, in particular as developed in Jürgen Renz's department, um, for many cases from ancient to modern history, may know the concept of mental models. They, in particular, form the basic framework for the approach of, on Einstein. Just see there's a four-volume big genesis of general relativity. And uh, from this approach, um, and for my purpose now, it suffices to explain how mental models relate to material models in this way. First of all, mental models can, as a rule, be externally represented by material models which also serve as the element of continuity in their transmission. And then the backbone of the long-term transmission of mental models is the transition of their material counterpart. And finally, mental models are characterized by a remarkable longevity across historical breaks, as becomes clear when considering such examples as a mental model of an atom, of a balance, of the center of gravity, or of positional weight. Now back from this more abstract theory to the center of my talk today, um, I will basically uh, focus on this one um, model, the Bohr model of the atom. There are others around. I just here mentioned that there is a typical model often invoked by physicists that of virtual oscillators, and there are many say, mental models which help physicists um, conceive of new theories. So um, my model is the planetary model of the atom. Here in particular, I would like to focus on the discussions of drawings and material models, both used in research and for dissemination. I will ask when were the models introduced in writing, in drawing, in assemblages, what changes did their status undergo, and when, if at all, were they withdrawn from the scientific discourse. One thing should be clear, models are around, you can touch them, you can manipulate them, they can be constructed and then can be destroyed. In short, models have a life of their own, but they don't live alone. So let's start me now with presenting you a preliminary outline of the main appearances of this model. Young lecturer of physical chemistry at the Sorbonne, 
Jean Perrin un introduced for the first time, I think, the planetary model to an audience of students and friends of the university on February 16, 1901. It appeared on no less than 12 pages in the in influential Revue Scientifique, a journal of a very elevated interdisciplinary or even semi-popular level. Here, Perrin spoke, speaks of soleil positif and planète négative. In this way, the detachment of one of the petit planètes gives rise to cathode rays, for example. He also observes a remarkable coincidence of the period of revolution, l'année de cette planète, and the frequencies of spectral lines, for example, in the case of aluminum. For heavy atoms, the outermost electron, the Neptune of the system, would become unstable, hinting at an explanation for radioactivity. In 1904, August Becker expands on this, his contribution to a review journal, Naturwissenschaftliche Wochenschrift, on Philip Leonard's 1903 Annalen paper, in which absorption experiments with cathode rays demonstrate the emptiness on the atomic scale. As the comparison with the universe of stars and planets is already in the Annalen, only the more popular review journal, only in the more popular review journal, a more graphical description of Leonard's ideas is communicated, including the need to adapt celestial mechanics for atomic physics. And here I have a quote. In considering a case like the H minus ion, he says Indeed, each cathode ray particle contains, and contained within a force field will orbit rapidly around the positive point or describe path. The knowledge thereof is to be expected from a yet-to-be-found solution of the three-body problem, which takes into consideration not only attracting forces, but also repelling ones. The more one delves into reviewing and popularizing texts, the more often and more explicit one can find the planetary model as the emerging picture for the microcosm. <coughs> Here are just two examples written by the astronomer Max Wilhelm Meyer, that Urania Meyer who ran together with Werner von Siemens and Wilhelm Förster, the Berlin Urania Institution, a prominent forum for popular science and spectacle like scientific theater. Meyer invokes a in various descriptive as well as romanticizing ways the micro-macro analogy and talks of suns, planets, orbits, etc. in the atomic realm. The first to establish a connection of orbits in, a, in an atomic setting with central charge and revolving electron with the quantum hypothesis was Johannes Stark. He tried to explain band spectra from recombination of a detached valence electron to its ground state that involved elliptical revolutions of decreasing size giving rise to the whole band spectrum. You may have heard of the thesis that Bohr's atom is a mere adaptation of Stark's argument, of Stark's atom dynamic, actually a three-volume work that Bohr had read just before writing down his trilogy of 1913. Probably, however, Stark's strong pushing of the quantum that was in his own case of rather limited success did first of all ignite Arnold Sommerfeld's interest in the matter, which was probably more important than the impact on Bohr who also found this way to atomic structure, his way to atomic structure from the same question of absorption of charged particles. For my story of the planetary atom, it's, most, it's more interesting to see also Bohr drawing lots of orbits even before he read Stark. 
His so-called Manchester Memorandum from 1912 demonstrates both the embedding of Bohr's ideas for the hydrogen atom into a much further going theory of molecules and matter. It was seen to account for empirical facts on the periodicity of atomic volumes or the possibility for hydrogen molecules in distinction to known existence of helium molecules, among others. But it was first of all uh, it was first of all Arnold Sommerfeld who created the atomic symbol and was crafting the first planetary exhibition model. In general, Sommerfeld's stance on atomic models gives rise to much discussion of his engineering crafting or even opportunistic attitude towards models. But he still is the guy who drew the basic icon of the atomic age and brought the first wood and wire model on display at one of the leading science museums, the Deutsches Museum in Munich. It was also Sommerfeld who gave Wolfgang Pauli as a topic for his dissertation, the calculation of the orbit of the simplest molecule. Oops, let's see. Did I go up? So I have to find, this is Sommerfeld's model, and this is the dissertation project of Pauli two nuclear, nu nuclei and one electron. And so um, what Pauli found is um, that uh, in his dissertation uh, that it is not really um, that the solution is not that you have one stable orbit in the middle between the two nuclei, but rather that uh, you get a complicated orbit uh, of the electron which more or less creates the shape of an ellipsoid. So it foreshadows somehow the electron cloud pictures which you later get from quantum mechanics. Um, all I know about this particular model is that somebody, probably Sommerfeld, thought it is important enough for material modeling and to be put on display at the Deutsches Museum. Unfortunately, all these models have been destroyed in the Second World War, so we only have a few pictures of them. So this is page down, yeah. A major new conceptualization of atomic theory was developed by Bohr between 1918 and 1922. It became his so-called second atomic theory which arose, which rose, rose greatest demand from German quantum physicists and probably had the biggest impact on the program towards quantum mechanics, as typically related to the Göttingen 1922 Bohr Festival with the entry of Werner Heisenberg. The illustration taken from Bohr's notes of 1920 shows nicely the planetary model put into relation with the periodic table. Bohr makes clear that electrons are not arranged in rings or in configurations of polyhedral symmetry as Sommerfeld, Blandé, and others tried. It were rather penetrating orbits that establish couplings of inner and outer electrons in more complicated atoms. These so-called diving orbits or Tauchbahnen were also discussed by Erwin Schrödinger in 1920. The biggest impact of the planetary model on the development of atomic theory was now, I would like to argue, that it was an important conceptual tool for the correspondence principle. In his 1921 letter to Nature on atomic structure, Bohr wrote, I quote, but the application of the correspondence principle seems to offer for the first time a rational theoretical basis for these conclusions and for the discussions of the arrangement of the orbits of electrons bound after the first two for more complicated elements. This principle offers a simple argument for concluding that these electrons are arranged in groups 
in a way which reflects the per period, periods exhibited in the chemical properties of the elements. So there's a strong uh, program of um, relating rules of drawing orbits with the periodic table. The widest dissemination of the planetary model occurred through the disciples of Bohr, namely Hendrik Kramers and Helge Holst. Their book, The Atom and the Bohr Theory of its Structure in Elementary Presentation, appeared in English in 1923 with a foreword by Rutherford. The Danish original was from 1922, the German edition 1925, the Dutch 1927, etc., etc. The two, the two color drawings actually copied larger plates Bohr had used in lectures. I have also indicated some popular journals in which the atomic models was re reprinted, and among them is Iberica, where you can find the same uh, drawings printed in 1924. Here's the German edition of this book, which actually has a chapter heading using the term planetary system. The drawings were put at the very end of the book and were meant to be folded out so that they were visible during all throughout reading the whole book. A number of different nice material models are due to Lawrence Bragg. In 1920, he was very critical of Bohr's model. However, this changed due to Douglas Hartree. I have written on this elsewhere, and in particular that Hartree adapted some ballistics methods he developed through World War I and, uh, adapt and, and used it to, to uh, calculate orbits in the atomic realm, this I cannot uh, detail here more. So uh, in 1923 Hartree wrote a paper that both meticulously calculated the penetrating orbits and then demonstrated that from the dimension of the orbits he could verify the results of Bragg's X-ray spectra of certain crystals. And you, here you see very nicely how the, say, British tradition of atomic models look, looks like. Um, and uh, so for this reason, a Bragg organized a whole industry of model building, and these models were not put uh, onto display first in a museum or used in teaching, but in 1924 there was a big Commonwealth exhibition in London in the Wembley Stadium area, and these models were used so in this say, more or less colonial uh, exhibition. And last but not least, here's a very nice uh, uh, um, photograph of how one tried to use this complicated, calculated, bore-like models to build an example of rock salt. Um, and uh, Hartree and uh, 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 Henry Lawrence Bragg tried to relate the information from X-ray experiments to the calculations which could give you some space arrangements from using this fancy planetary models. So I now uh, jump quickly to some examples that even after quantum mechanics, one could keep on using the planetary model. And this is an illustration from the best-selling German journal Cosmos from 1928. It is, I think, a very nice visualization of Erwin Schrödinger's first publication on wave mechanics, which had the title Quantization as an Eigenvalue Problem. As you see, the, there is this orbit still around, but you see there's this wave, and in this case, the wave doesn't match just in the upper side. So this is not an eigenvalue. This wave doesn't give a stable. But if, if the wave has the right dimension, so if it's an eigenvalue, then... So in this sense, there is a marriage between, say, an orbital model and quantum mechanics. 
What happened to the modeling with the advent of quantum mechanics? Can, we, can quantum mechanical models still convey comparable, in a comparable extent atomic knowledge? In a sense, models of atoms according to quantum mechanics lack the structural information one could get from the old quantum theory, or to put it in a different perspective, also today's physicists may agree that so-called semi-classical approximation carries more content than some quantum mechanical alternatives. Here's the point at which my studies become very much a uh, work in progress. What one should try now, which I haven't done yet, is to get an idea how these newer semi-classical considerations uh, in the early quantum mechanical analysis of more complicated systems have developed. Clearly, as Kuhn has said, and I quoted him in the beginning, in order to write down the Schrödinger equation for a more complex atom, you more or less use your uh, knowledge of, say, the, the old quantum theory to, to organize and, and to, to um, uh, give your calculations and your descriptions some structure. So um, that for these more complex cases, a physicist quickly realized the helpfulness of semi-classical thinking in terms of orbits and planetary models. One thing, however, that seems clear is um, that these planetary models of the atom, that they have a certain spell, a certain mystery, few people, even physicists, can't evade. Here's Bohr's case, as observed from the outside. William Lawrence Bragg wrote to the director of the London Science Museum in 1946 that the material models are still on, of much interest. Quote, I even found Bohr himself gazing at them in a fascinated way when he visited us last summer. And he suggested to put a warning to visitors in some way that be aware these are historical models and not the true ones, but they are so nice and so, so interesting so that nobody wants to remove them from, from this play. And uh, just um, on my route to uh, closing, I just uh, have another uh, um, illustration of the combination of modeling of mechanics and quantum theory um, instead of expanding on the re resurfacing of, on the planetary model in semi-classical physics, which would be a nice project, um, I introduce you to Harvey Elliott White. Harvey Elliott White did his PhD in Cornell in 29. He was a Rockefeller Fellow in, in Berlin, uh, and he returned in 1930 to Berkeley. And in 1931, he wrote a very interesting paper in a very much used paper, not cited, but used paper, um, pictorial representations of the electron cloud for hydrogen-like atoms. And later, White became the American TV professor. He had physics, educational physics show on 100, 150 stations nationwide in the morning in, in, in American television, and later he became the uh, director of the Lawrence Hall of Science, a kind of science museum, science center in, in Berkeley, uh, in the Bay Area. In his 1931 paper, White prints the following table of, quote, photographs of the electron clouds for various states of hydrogen-like atoms. Now you may wonder, how do you do these photographs? And the funny thing is, you might have seen, who, whom of you has seen these pictures already? They are very widespread, they are everywhere, in chemistry textbook, everywhere. So, but what is it? What do we see? The funny thing is that um, the, if you just read the labeling, it says photographs of the electron cloud for various stages of the hydrogen-like atoms as obtained from various models and the device shown in figure five. So these pictures are made by a device which typically is not reprinted in all their 
reprints. And this device is now a funny thing. It's a mechanical device where you put some kind of shape into rotation, then you photograph it with a long uh, exposure time, and if you do it nicely, you get exactly how this... Now you have, we have computer. There's no problem to program the computer to give us the electron density. But this time, you needed a mechanical model in order to show how quantum mechanically the atom looks like. And with this example, I would like to close, and I try to give you a short overview of all these imaginary models and the imagery which atomic models had, and I tried to convince you that it's not only calculations and rules and, say, paper tools, but these kinds of pictures very much influence our thinking, our progress of atomic theory. So thank you for your attention. Actually, this, this picture, this or? <laughs> Which one? This one? Well, I guess we just have to go into the um, into this, and then you can see it's some specific quantum mechanical state. And where is it? It's this 3D case for. 3D, 3D, yes, I don't remember. You mean that these pictures were used no, for a specific thing? Uh, hmm? uh, mm -hmm. If you okay. have more details, I would be interested to learn Thank this. Thank you. Yeah. No, no. Because, yeah. Nowadays, can be photographed by, by electron microscopy directly without any... Well, this is, the, this is the funny thing, which we have ho today all these nano-photographs that we see single atoms and everything in nice colors and shapes and shades, but clearly this is all computer-generated. The big problem is... What do we see? And this is also a long discussion. This means this here in White's case, we know how this mechanical device looks like. The problem today is that we feed in the computer some algorithms to produce nice pictures to us, but in which sense are they true? In which sense do atoms look like this? And this is a big discussion because uh, typically we, we know from we, we only know macroscopic viewing with light uh, wavelengths, and so in a sense it's very difficult to say we um, do we see electron uh, probability densities? Do we see them? Is this the right way to picture? My uh, my um, the point is always probably there are very different representations of the atomic reality, and this is only one. And there is not nobody can claim that he has a true picture of an ele of an atom. There are some questions already. You first, no yourself. Okay, hey, you want to ask a question? No, no, I'm not going to Well, this device, mechanical device, suggests. In fact, uh, I think it was rumored at that time a kind of sort of erotic theory was uh, making this correspondence. Uh, one can think in a summer for what summer for model developing in time, mm -hmm. uh, high speeds, and during uh, the time of any observation, uh, the electron will feel the same. So uh, it's 
I think until quantum mechanics um, came, uh, people thought in a statistical matter way on a logic uh, theory uh, to figure mm -hmm. what uh, was happening. And now uh, we are in a similar situation. Steve Barry, I think, has made uh, calculations on heavy matter to electrons and all that that were forbidden in the time of the uh, quantum mechanics. And in fact, uh, it comes out that uh, letting evolve in the computer so many times, we generate actually with classical trajectories mm -hmm. uh, such kind of probability density. But this is out of the standard view of quantum mechanics. So it's not uh, taught, not communicated. It's, it has been set apart from the uh, standard view of science, but uh, see it, it's a philosophical mm -hmm. and metaphysical issue, I think, still mm -hmm. now. You know, my, my main point is that part of all the say, discussion is that we, we cannot um, do science without having these pictures in mind. And in this sense, uh, even this is a big uh, discussion in, for, from pedagogy. Shall we introduce students to uh, high school students to Bohr's model, or should we better tell them first what quantum mechanics say truly tells us? Um, because this is all wrong. So the, the, the hydrogen atom has a rotation in, in Bohr's uh, uh, model, but we know the, 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 there is no angular momentum for the ground state of the hydrogen. So there's a many, but the, the problem is, uh, and what I try to allude is that even, say, the most uh, 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 hardcore dedicated quantum mechanists would somehow use this picture in their background to do estimates, calculations, approximation uh, theories. And I'm, I'm still, I still think this is an interesting field to go through these approximation techniques and relate them how much this is, say, some semi-classics theory is still involved, although they say we start with, uh, um, with the quantum mechanical formalism and then we do some uh, well-argued steps to, to reduce complexity for, for a calculation. But um, I feel this correspondence corresponds to some geometrical uh, arguments as well. Mm. There's a question over there. Well, the, the idea of this wide photographs was clearly that, that he knew what, but the problem was he had no computer that he just could put in the formula and print it out as we would it today. But, but what, what can you do without a computer? So he tried to figure out whether he can just t take, construct a shape which in rotation would then give this picture of the, the, the spherical harmonics or whatever, which is, uh, um, uh, pertains to this uh, quantum uh, state. Thank you. And I'd like to ask also, um, do you know the um, Well, the, 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 say, the nearest what I can get is something like this, where you could say that the wave somehow um, suggests to you a movement like an electron orbiting. At the same time, the, uh, say, the stable closure of this wave alludes to you that there's an eigenvalue problem. Uh, but, well, probably 
it only conveys that we like to think in pictures. So in, in principle, we, we can just stick to our, say, pictureless theory, but it becomes much easier to memorize or to, to, to in, in, if you have these pictures ready, but probably, and this is uh, a good um, discussion for um, uh, teaching physics, is to ask, is it helpful to introduce, to invoke these pictures, or do they lead to more suggestions which leave ast astray? So, say, since all, uh, even in particular, if you have this, uh, these kinds of uh, uh, models, three-dimensional three models, then you get so many ideas what you could measure and do with them and explain chemistry or whatsoever, and probably this is more misleading than helpful, but for, say, the very basic uh, questions of a historian of science, I think it's very important that uh, you find that, say, this pictorial uh, part it plays a very big role in the history of physics. Mm -hmm. um, Lino? Yes, thank you very much. I find it very appealing this area to me, the importance of things. But I wanted maybe to, I wanted to elaborate on what actually knowing through models means. And for this, I think it would be important to make some distinctions between within types of material models. So in this case, the planetary model, we cannot forget that it's not, it's not a model from the planets to the, to the atom. It's, so the, our model for the planets is already a model, right? So the, the orbits with the solar system, with the sun in the middle, uh, well, not in the middle, in, in one side, it's already a model. And the, the army, the army area is here that was used during the early modern period. That is a physical model, and it's not the planets themselves. Of course, it's, it's you know it's projected on paper and then it's it's carried on into a sphere. So there we have a material model that, that we can use and it's very operational. When we use that model into the into to create a model for the atom, we may be using more a metaphor than an actual material model, or at least we, the model we are using now is a model of the model. So it's. It carries, I think, less operational weight than the, than the real Armenian sphere, for instance. So my question here is, is uh, about, yeah, the, exactly, the, 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 epistemology, the, the differences, between the, the epistemological differences within material models. Mm -hmm. um, probably there are two ways and two approaches uh, uh, for um, your question. Um, there's clear, there's lots of discussion about models in the philosophy of science and what exactly is a model and uh, is, is there a model of a model and uh, is the model first and then the application to some physical reality and uh, I was never very comfortable with all this discussion. You can look it up in this, what is Stanford Encyclopedia of, of uh, Philosophy. There's a big entry of what else, what, what's a model. So you have 100 pages what a model can be. I prefer the say, historical approach. And first of all, I think it always is first some kind of, say, nature observation or whatever from which you extract a model. And it's not first the model and then you apply it to the planets. And uh, so my say, historical route, and I will tell you, uh, tell you in a moment why I think this is uh, very grounded, is that um, it is really the planetary model, that see, the astronomical model, which, as I demonstrated to you, was picked up by young Jean Perrin, by popularizers. Uh, there was much talk about Petit Soleil and Petit Planet uh, uh, circulating before there was any physical evidence that uh, the atoms are real and that there are electrons and there is rotation or whatsoever. Um, and the, my claim is, if you look into the history of popularization, who was popularizing natural knowledge 
in the 19th century, first of all, that were uh, the astronomers, because they had this public uh, um, uh, telescopes. So this was the main place, of, uh, and also the most say, uh, uh, popular places for, for, for uh, laymen to confront with, with uh, physics or astronomy. And so if you look into the literature of popularization, it is to a great deal astronomers who write. And now clearly it's, it's a, so from, a, from this historical point of view, I would simply say, and astronomers, if you ask them, what about the, the, the very tiny? What about matter? So it's kind of a deformation professionnelle that an astronomer, everything what an astronomer sees must be like in, in the cosmos. So there's a macrocosm, there's microcosm. So their answer is, and their famous example, like this Uran, is this Max, Max Wilhelm Meyer, who, who was working with Förster in the Berlin Sternwarte. And he, uh, he became a very prolific uh, popular science writer, and he had very... Uh, romanticizing accounts. He was sitting in Capri, sun is setting, he actually was living at Capri for a time, and was contemplating about the stars and so on. And then he said, well, what about matter? What can probably, it's the same that there are many planets, rotations. So it is more or less that due to the fact that in the history of the interaction of science and public, the popularizers were astronomers, I feel that there was this tendency to have this planetary metaphor, planetary model, microcosm, uh, modeled after macrocosm. Uh, so this is that Bohr hasn't, there was no need for Bohr to invent the planetary model. It was around. He just had to pick it and say, yes, I have uh, evidence that uh, art atoms really look like this. And I uh, think it's still worthwhile to distinguish, and I have a little bit this problem talking about models all the time, uh, material models. So I often say it's wood and brass models. Or, uh, so since this is something else as a mathematician would call a model. And so we have, but um, as uh, historians um, and uh, people who look at, say, scientific culture, uh, they do not like to define in the beginning what their notions mean. So if you say a model is a certain representation with the following properties and so on, because then you are fixed to one, uh, so you, you rather would like to, to discuss the use of the term model, and I did not expand here, so uh, then I um, agree that some colleagues would rather differentiate between analogy and model. And uh, I, not, for this talk, uh, try to um, motivate from this um, uh, discussion between Thomas Kuhn and Richard Bord about metaphors that at least there is some, say, epistemological important uh, impact of using uh, material models. Mm -hmm. you have a I have the feeling that models are very useful when geometrical uh, considerations are important in the, in the development. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one has been brought up for scattering, mm -hmm. just simulating a small nucleus, uh, solve the problem. But there are other, other situations when models cannot be put on. For instance, the spin, even work, where puts the spin in the model? Can it be represented as a geometrical form? Well, you, you're correct, I guess, to say that within, within the, say, class, uh, Bohr model of an atom, the notion of spin does not fit. But in the, at the same time, why is it called spin? Because people have the model that it is a rotating small ball. It's not true. There is no rotation in the sense of mechanical rotation, but the atomic system behaves, behaves as if there was a rotation. And, for example, a yeah. very, very nice thing is, um, you know that the spin of uh, the, the, uh, the famous Stern-Gerlach experiment demonstrates there is a spin in the hydrogen atom. And the people uh, believing in Bohr's model think, well, that's a rotation of the electron. No, 
we know the electron doesn't rotate, in the, but it has a kind of imp, in, implicit interior rotation. But now the funny um, thing uh, appears, um, I think. Um, uh, that uh, if you look for the proton, the nuclear spin is also there. So the proton has a nuclear spin. And it, you can understand because the proton is charged. So probably there's a positive charge rotating in some sense. So because this, uh, the, it, it, it all concerns uh, magnetic moments. But now what about the neutron, which is neutral? There is no charge. It still has a magnetic how come? Now we would say, well, quarks and so on. But it, it's funny, so that the spin is, a, is, is again a model, I would say. We, we model this specific um, property of atomic particles as if it's a rotation, but there's nothing which rotates. But, more breu, more breu, yeah, what, what about the model of quantum entanglement, a geometrical model? Of quantum entanglement? Uh, uh, quantum entanglement. Yeah. How to model in a in a in a geometrical figure image? I'm not sure whether each say theoretical claim has a geometrical model, but um, in my uh, what what came to my mind is since you said we need geometry in order to have a model. But what about the, the uh, uh, what, what about a classical gas? You, you have the mechanical model of small balls bouncing. So this is also a model which is, well, still somehow geometric, but you have also kind of, say, statistical models, or it, it need not be as a, a, a mechan a mechanical in the way that you could build the model out of wood and brass and s use your screwdriver. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I was going to ask about the models again, but I think you've answered uh, most of the questions I had in mind. So I, I was wondering, have you come across any criticism of the use of these models, contemporary criticism? Because physicists, models were very popular in electricity, for instance, in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. And some physicists, by the end of the century, had learned to dismiss models and stay with the equations. Mm -hmm. And now you find other physicists at the beginning of the next century, so the 20th century, using models again. So my question is, have you come across some kind of criticism by physicists? on the limitations of these models, on the need to go beyond what physical models suggest us and begin thinking differently. Because I see kind of paradox that Bohr himself had spent a lot of time and effort trying to overcome the limitations of physical mm -hmm. things and the classical way of looking at things. And there you find a very classical way of looking at things. So, mm -hmm. How did people at the time, not now, deal with these contradictions? Mm. Well, basically, I think this concerns two points. Um, looking at the, in particular, British use of models in the 19th century, um, this is partly a different story because the, say, British tradition of modeling was always thought not to depict reality, but to as a means to make some progress that you, for example, Maxwell was thinking of many, I don't know, rotating uh, things and, and he used this model to, uh, to construct his Maxwell equations. Once he had them, he threw away the models. So it was just a heuristic means, uh, but no um, commitment that there's some reality in it. Mainly what I try today with my model, these are models which got some realism, that really people at least started to think, yes, atoms are small planetary systems. And just to give you an example, Peter Debye, um, who is famous for his Debye-Scherer method of X-ray 
deflection. He developed this method because he thought he could photograph electron rings. If he has atoms which are randomly distributed, just learned his, his lesson from the Lauer experiment, he conceived that even though you get some uh, signal from these rings, and he tried to find the signals and there was nothing there, but he found, oh, great, but we still have signals, but they come from the molecular. And so uh, he wrote nice papers on the structure of the interior of the atom, and at one moment he only wrote the structure of the interior of the molecule. He, 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 so he glossed over his initial program to make photographs of the electron rings and then said proudly, well, look, we have a nice method for something else. And so what I wanted to point at is that people in the time, in the first quarter of the 20th century, took, took them for real, or at least devised experiments to test whether these rings of these models are true. And so what I'm basically interested in is these kinds of models which could be taken real, while those mainly in the earlier centuries were some kinds of helpful instances to, to make some progress, but you um, do not g uh, uh, um, uh, give them, say, a status of, of reality. Okay. Rawadi? Yeah. Um, an interesting concept that you are putting here on the table. Um, um, I'm very, very interested in, the, in your opinion about uh, using the atomic model of what in educational and communicating strategies for uh, scientific people. Um, I wonder if you agree with me that the atomic model of what is the most widespread knowledge that most people have about the atomic theory. I think that, that that's positive mm -hmm. at least. That mm -hmm. you have a, a model that is not so incorrect. Mm -hmm. This is, this is exactly the say, more interesting uh, discussion we should um, have today. Um, uh, since there's one fraction who says, well, you are right, this is say, the, the, the most widespread atomic knowledge the average person has, and you shouldn't destroy it. <laughs> so at least it's something elaborate and there's some, some understanding in science. And, and, and others, and there, uh, at least I know this from, from German uh, um, uh, didactics professors and so, who always try to get rid of all this unnecessary stuff. And um, there's also um, typically a quantum mechanics te textbooks which start just with Stern Gerlach experiment in order to explain there, there is a strange world out there. You don't expect to, 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 to model it in a mechanical fashion. <laughs> And, but uh, when this year the German Physical Society, which has a journal, physics journal, were looking around, what can we do about 100 years Bohr atom? And uh, I advised them, not, man, not one more historic article, how great Bohr was and how did, in which night did he realize that, and so on and so on. We were looking around and we found um, um, some uh, American scholars, Marlon Scully and Dudley Hirschbach, a Nobel Prize winner from some years ago, who used Bohr's model but um, uh, modified a little bit uh, for uh, developing approximations of simple molecules. For example, just using two nuclei in taking two um, orbits, but not putting them at this directions where Bohr had them, but shifting them a little bit in some direction. And then they did something very, say, strange, but very effective. They, they were very um, good at um, uh, uh, quantum chromodynamics and advanced theory, where, where you have all these methods of dimensional scaling. So what they prove more or less is if you take the Schrodinger equation to an infinite dimension, do some scaling limit, then you get some energy operator which looks like Bohr, Bohr model. 
So there's some kind of relation between these models, and these they used that they demonstrated that using their model, semi-classical model of a simple molecule, is a much better approximation than Hartree-Fock or more advanced things. So this again, and I tried them to explain me why. How come? So was Bohr theory, is there some truth in it? But they said, well, we, we just use it as a means. So it's still open, but uh, at least for, say, from a historical point of view, I might uh, say, well, it cannot be this wrong. <laughs> uh, it doesn't, it, it has some, say, um, has some wrong um, indications for hydrogen. It doesn't work for, for, for helium and so on. This was a big problem historically. But for modeling these, and this is a big intuition of Bohr, who started with uh, not drawing atoms but whole molecules, that this is at least is such a productive image, such productive models that we shouldn't exclude it from teaching and from, from discussing. Hmm. Carlos? Carlos? I just realized I didn't uh, ask, uh, answer your second question um, about the criticism of, of, of Bohr's model, which may uh, uh, fit, here, uh, fit in here. Well, um, interestingly, the harshest criticism against models like Bohr's came from the physicists themselves. The public was happy to have this picture. And it was sad when in, in 1925 people were telling you shouldn't use it anymore. No. And in, in all exhibitions in the Deutsche Museum and the Science Museum, they were all around. They're still in the Science Museum. They're still there um, because they are so nice. Um, so um, in a typical criticism of physicists were, well, look, I have also a model which is much nicer which is some rotating disks or whatever, so that people didn't grasp in which sense the Bohr model was, say, specifically explaining something others' model couldn't do, who just said, well, I, I have a Bohr model is okay, but I have a better one. So there are many in, 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 uh, in a journal called Die Naturwissenschaften, which was a journal meant to, uh, to, to address a... Uh, all, all scientists to address physicists, chemists, biologists as uh, alike. Within this forum, many there are quite a number of publications in the 19 from between 1913 and 1920 of physicists, chemists who more or less uh, raised their hand and said, "Well, look, I have a better one." 
but they often did not realize what the, say, important contribution of Bohr's model was. Just to um, give you one uh, um, impression, um, there is a rotation of Bohr's model, and typically this was what Bohr thought in 1912, that the rotation frequency has to do with the frequencies you can observe. And the most important insight of Bohr was that this isn't true. The frequencies you observe simply calculate from the energies of two uh, states, while the rotation which is present in his model is unrelated to this in a sense, only in the classical limit then you. And so Bohr in a sense broke with a truth from mechanical theory in order to establish his, his, his model. And this was, say, a very important step. And other models didn't realize that this is... Uh, Sommerfeld somehow wrote, sometimes wrote a public uh, a lecture on, on his, and he was... Uh, um, he, he, he started with introducing this analogy that if you, you can... If, if there's an, an airplane which has a propeller, and so you hear, can hear by the sound how, how quickly it rotates. He said, beware, this is not true in the atomic realm. The sound, the, the wavelengths you can observe, do not uh, uh, relate to the rotation. And so he tried to uh, uh, also explain these strange things about the... Well, now, now coming to the um, double helix, which is a different beast of a model, I guess, in, in various, since it is more or less a scale model. So it tries, it says, well, here is the tyranine molecule, and there's the adenine, and they have some angle and some distance. Uh, but now from the uh, use and the uh, importance of this model in the history of science, this is a tremendous story. First of all, why did they build this huge model, which then was photographed? because there was an open day in the Cavendish lab and people would come in and wanted to see something. They had only a small one and they big, built only the big one because there was somebody coming along and they still had not some, some, some sticks and things they could use. Um, then uh, there is the, the thesis, uh, I guess we cannot <laughs> go into much more detail here, but the thesis I like best about the uh, double helix is that not Watson Quick made the double helix, but the double helix made Watson Quick. Having this picture, they became so famous. So because it was so visual, and the, and the sad thing about the story, we now just have an, um, an exhibition at the Naturkunde Museum in Berlin about 60 years of the double helix. What the exhibition, exhibition makers try to uh, convey is that probably the most important contribution in the um, discovery of the double helix was Rosalind Franklin's X-ray photograph. And so the icon of the double helix should be her X-ray photograph and not this strange model. But this is typically a mechanism of women in science that these two clever young Cambridge scholars made, uh, found a way that made them famous and this elderly lady in, in, in London should make her household things and mm -hmm. so on. Right. Any more questions? May, may, may I add something? Uh, is, is there any evidence to compare, for example, the kind of model you have in a popular journal, in an academic specialized paper and in a textbook? Mm -hmm. Is it possible to trace back, for example, I don't know in the case of Bohr, no? but in some of the cases you show the way, my, my, my point is to what extent we are playing with this model for different audiences. Yeah? And it's because I think you, you show many examples of popular journals at the same time. Well, you have a textbook here. Is there any way to, to try to trace back this, this circulation of models through, the, through these different uh, potential audiences? Well, it's, um, I think it's, it's interesting to uh, realize um, that what, what now is very um, typical if you have a popular science magazine from the newsstand, they have some special department of information graphics which make every 
um, illustration which you could find in a uh, in a scholarly journal. They would make it in color. They make it three dimensional. They make it say, mock it up in some way mm -hmm. to make it more interesting. And uh, as far as I know, it's more or less that these are the original Bohr commissioned plates. <laughs> And they ended up in Iberica just reprinted. Uh, so I cannot really see that there was an industry of translating these. Be and there was no need, I guess. They are, in a sense, uh, uh, have these visual qualities and wider audience. I may be, uh, since this is also one of my favorite st stories, uh, which I may add here, um, what about European images of the model. So I, I had this implicitly here say, telling you oops, um, that there is the German iconography of atomic models, and this model is clearly tremendous. So you have the force lines, you have little arrows at it, and, and this model is, has been made from these drawings of Sommerfeld, and then they seem too flat, too uninteresting. So they asked an architect, an, an, an Bavarian architect von Tiersch, to help them to make a more interesting model. And he, for example, suggested, well, take the field forces of the one example and the, the, the uh, um, motion of the other and so on. So this is an artistic rendering already. While the British models, oops, now I have been jumping too far, while the British models are just less, say, less elaborate, uh, less uh, popularized in a sense, uh, and have a different quality. So the British one, we are more looking for the, 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 the whole series of uh, different atoms, while in the George's Museum you only had the hydrogen one and this, this uh, Pauli uh, thing, but not the whole series of all elements. And uh, now the, the question is, what about the French? What, how do French atomic models of Bohr look like? And then the funny thing is, you need a reason to build a model. So the director of the Deutsches Museum wrote a letter to Sommerfeld. He heard that there's now Bohr theory whether he could give him some models. And he said, well, okay, let's see, we will do it. In the uh, Br uh, British case, there was this uh, um, uh, uh, British Empire exhibition. And there was Bragg uh, thinking that one could use these models to relate some physical properties and distances within... Uh, to, to this, and, uh, and there was the Science Museum, which after this um, exhibition took all the models. What about the French? They did not have a, this kind of museum at this time, and they were very late to learn about the Bohr theory because the French physics wasn't very active in the first quarter of the 20th century. For this reason, the window between Bohr and quantum mechanics, which was, say, open in Germany between 1915 with Sommerfeld taking it up to 1921, and I, I told you that uh, um, Rutherford and Bragg initially didn't think much about Bohr's model. It took them until 1922 that they said, well, let's try uh, whether it's something good coming out. And my thesis is the French were just too late starting to build a model, and when quantum mechanics came along and Louis de Broglie was their hero, they more or less have this kind of wave-like structures. Uh, so when, if you, when you, even some years ago when I went to the Palais de la Découverte, uh, I couldn't find these orbital models, but I could find many De Broglie-like wave pictures. So uh, for this reason, there is no French uh, um, uh, Bohr-like uh, planetary model. Hmm. Okay. Una última pregunta, last question. That's enough, I think. Uh, huh? Okay. That's enough. Thank you very much to all of you for Thank coming you to for the paper. Thank you, Arne, for the discussion.